this is just a very brief refresher before we start talking about the other things that we'll talk about in this class. I don't know why that's the way that is. That's interesting. Never mind. And those things are this. Um, from 4, 452, you will remember that uh, Darcy's Law is this. Uh, you probably used uh, hydraulic head in that class. Uh, and that uh, volumetric flow rate for a system that has some cross-sectional area A and some length dx and some change in head as you go along it dh and some hydraulic conductivity k gives you some volumetric flow rate q coming out bless you and so you certainly know that um, you know the reasons for the minus sign what are the reasons for the minus sign let's start shout Yes, partly. What, what convention, though? Okay. What convention? Like X, Y, Z convention? Yes. Same yes, right. So it, it flows from high potential to low. So if you plot head versus uh, direction, then if we kind of draw this here, then this is dh and dx. This is a negative gradient, right? Gradient is negative. Uh, no, it's positive, right? Positive in that quadrant. But the flow in this particular case would be in the minus x direction. And so it really is that the flow velocity is a scalar quantity. It has speed and direction. Uh, and therefore, uh, the direction part is the reason for this. So, Otherwise, the, the minus will drop out. We don't care about it particularly. So this is flow rate, uh, volumetric flow rate. The other way to the more uh, standard, the raw form of Darcy's law is that Darcy velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity and the gradient. Um, <coughs> Darcy velocity is the velocity that turns up in this. So this term here would give you the poorly named V sub D uh, term. This is the, the, the Darcy velocity term, just from, from this. So this, if you multiply this Darcy velocity by the total area of your aquifer, you end up with a volumetric flow rate. So by convention, that's what Darcy's law is. But the actual speed, if you like, that an individual molecule of water is traveling through this is the advective velocity. And so the time it will take for this particle to go from upstream to downstream is given if you take the Darcy velocity and divide it through by the porosity. And so if you take the cross-section of your aquifer to look like this, I don't know if you'd cover this in 452 or not. And if you think of um, your aquifer as being a whole bunch of uh, sand grains, say, through which water can't flow, so the only flowing in the system is in the space around it. And if you could centrifuge this, so that this was the volume of the solid grains and this or the area and the volume of the voids then you could imagine that if you're pushing a certain amount of fluid over this same cross section but instead you're pushing it through a small area then it will travel much faster through it and so the rate at which a particle flows from upstream to downstream is given by the porosity 
sorry, the, the, the Darcy velocity, which is this, divided by the porosity. And the porosity, by definition, n is equal to the volume of voids divided by the volume total. I guess the volume total here would be this whole cross-sectional area. You can think of these as, oops, you can think of these as areas, right? It's the same length, so volumes and areas. And so that's one thing you, you, you need to know. And so what are you going to be asked in this first assignment is Yucca Mountain, which is now defunct. The canisters break open at nuclear waste repository. There's a certain hydraulic gradient between here and Long Street, which is 20, 30 kilometers away. And so you know this. Then calculate how long it takes to get there. Well, it takes as long to get there as velocity is equal to length over time. So time is equal to length over velocity. But this velocity is the advective velocity. So be aware of that. So, so I think it's a, well, KJ's here to help you. I'm here to help you, but KJ's much more friendly than I am. And, uh, so you don't want to see me. And so those are the, the steps you need. So you need to realize that if you have a hydraulic gradient, you can calculate a Darcy velocity. If you have a Darcy velocity and a porosity, you can calculate an advective velocity. If you have an advective velocity uh, and a length over which it has to travel to get to some place, you can figure out how long it takes to get there. 20 years, 30 years, one year, one day. And that's what you need. So that's the first thing you need. And I think the other thing you need for that question is this relationship between hydraulic conductivity. This is a standard relationship. Hydraulic conductivity is probably, well, this is hydraulic conductivity, which is Darcy's law written for hydrologists. This is kind of a class in the hydrology domain. You can also write uh, Darcy's law for petroleum engineers, which would be something like permeability divided by dynamic viscosity and a gradient in pressure rather than head. So this is, these, these two equations are similar to each other, but they're not quite the same, right? Different dependent variable, this is still V sub D, and a different term here. But you can always move backwards and forwards between them by knowing that permeability and hydraulic conductivity are related through this, these physical constants. Viscosity of the fluid, dynamic viscosity of the fluid, you know that that's Pascal seconds, if you remember anything from 303. Density of the fluid, kilograms per cubic meter. Gravity, gravitational acceleration, 9.81 meters a second. And so I think in that question, I'm not preparing you just to, to do well in the, the assignments, but it's perhaps helpful in the first case to understand what you might be doing. Uh, permeabilities of tufts at Yucca Mounds, and I don't know, they're 10 to the minus 15 meters squared or something of that order. And so if you know that, and if you want to use this equation, you just need to calculate what the hydraulic conductivity is. The difference between permeabilities and hydraulic conductivities are that petroleum engineers use permeabilities because it's a function of the reservoir only. Hydraulic conductivities depend on whether you're flowing water or treacle or gas, uh, air through the system. Permeability is a, a single number for a sandstone core that you have. Single number. It doesn't matter what you're flowing through it, because what you're flowing through it gets automatically accommodated in the equation by including its viscosity. And so that's why it's used for petroleum engineering. And also petroleum engineers tend to use pressures rather than heads, again by convention, just, just for that reason. Okay? So that's a bit of a refresher. Um, and I guess the other component related to that, uh, also this is just related to that assignment, is that, for instance, um, well, I guess it's just an example of doing this. If you have canisters that are broken open upstream and they flow downstream, 
And if from the hydraulic gradient, you know, if you knew that the, I think this is how it's given, you're given a change in head that occurs over some length, then you can definitely calculate VD from that, right? You know this, you know this. And so long as you can calculate this from a permeability, then you have a Darcy velocity. If you know what the Darcy velocity is, then you can de facto calculate what the advective velocity is just by dividing it by the porosity, 10%, not an unusual number. And that gives you an advective velocity. So porosity is always less than one, right? It's a fraction of this. So if you imagine taking uh, this and centrifuging it down, uh, the porosity is the fraction of this open area relative to the total area. So in other words, if you have a cross-section through a, a material with lots of um, grains in it, it's the fraction of that cross-sectional area which is open. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, residence time distribution. Yeah. Residence time distribution. How long it stays within the system. In other words, how long it takes to get to you. So I, I, well, I was going to come back to that anyway. Um, and uh, so this is always less than 1. And so the advective velocity is always faster than Darcy velocity. So laws travel faster because it's going through a, a smaller cross-sectional area. And the same volumetric flow has to make it across that <coughs> smaller volumetric, smaller cross-sectional area. So if the porosity is 10%, then it goes 10 times faster uh, than it would do, uh, yeah, 10 times faster. So instead of uh, 1 meter a year, it'll go 10 meters per year, etc. If you know what the advective velocity is, which is this, then you can always calculate the time it takes to get to some place downstream just from writing velocity out in terms of what it is, length over advective velocity when it's rearranged, and it turns out that you can calculate that if it's flowing downstream, it'll it will arrive in 100 years. And so if you draw, quote unquote, a residence time distribution, this term here, it's just a fancy way of thinking about what the arrival concentration would be. So in other words, um, you have the repository up here, the, the casks break open, and it slowly starts traveling downstream. It starts traveling downstream at this velocity. And so if you're measuring the concentrations at this point here, when it's got to this point here, there's no effect here. The concentration is zero. So if you draw a plot of concentration, uh, can you see this okay? You talked about what you could and couldn't see last time. Too big, I guess. So if you look, uh, when it hasn't arrived yet, then the concentration will always be less, will just be zero, just be the background concentration of water washing past. But when this has finally got down to you, when you're, where you're measuring stuff in your well, all of a sudden the concentration will arrive and it will jump up to whatever the upstream concentration is that it's traveling from. That's, a, that's the residence time distribution. So what you're going to be asked in that assignment is, what happens to the residence time distribution if you have a system like this? How long will it be? What will be this ordinate on the, the arrival time? But then also, if you have an aquifer, which instead of just being one material where it flows through from upstream, this figure will actually be in the assignment, if it comes through three different aquifers and pours out. In other words, you could think of this as three different pipes of different transmission velocities, so maybe it arrives here first, from this one second and this one third. What is this residence time distribution going to look like? It's going to look like a stair step. But I'll let you figure that out. So that's the question. So, uh, and they're real-world examples. Well, I guess it was a real-world example before Yucca Mountain got cancelled. Uh, and we're now looking, as we said last time, about different ways of disposing of this. But the same, same principle applies for the other... 30 countries in a developed world that all have to get rid of their um, rad waste. <laughs>
So that's just a clue. All right, so that was a preamble, if you like. So, there. Close the door. It's not as noisy, but it's really nice. Okay. All right, so um, we talked in the, the syllabus about the kinds of things that we would uh, uh, entertain. And so they're all divided up in the same way. might be familiar to some of you. Uh, this 2-1, you know, the first topic of, the first part of topic 2, I guess, is 2-1. And so we mentioned last time about L-napples and D-napples. Lighter than water and denser than water, non-aqueous phase liquids. The history was that in uh, Love Canal, which predates you, it was the 70s, where Boeing and some other con uh, companies disposed of um, drums of solvents in uh, a disused canal, which was then filled in, overfilled, and then buildings put on top of it, and a lot of people got sick. A uh, court case come, came out of it, and apparently the mythology is that the term l nabble was uh, devised to represent these noxious contaminants because the lawyers thought that it had a nice, the lawyers for the defense against the contamination thought it had a nice ring to it because it sounded like apple. And what could be bad with apples? And I don't know if that's urban myth, but that's supposed to be the way it was. Uh, I was alive at that time, but I wasn't involved in those things. So that's the, the origin of those terms. But uh, we'll talk about immiscible transport. Uh, which is our first topic. And to understand that, we need to know something about surface tension and interfacial behavior. You never thought you'd be using your stuff from week one of fluid mechanics again, but it's Im quite important and central to what we're doing here. Uh, and we'll use that to define uh, transport behavior within uh, bundles of capillaries which represent pores media. So that's kind of what we do. That's our plan. So I'm sure in a bunch of your classes, you've seen things like this before. Uh, if you've taken anything in kind of environmental uh, engineering or environmental science. And so the two different behaviors that we're interested in are epitomized by this figure. It's really only one behavior, but they're epitomized by these two figures. So where a liquid which won't mix with water non-aqueous phase, it doesn't, go, doesn't dissolve very readily in water, but stays as a separate phase, and happens to be uh, lighter than water, which is what this L is, light non-aqueous phase liquid. And if you spill it on the surface, then as we talked last time, what would happen in this zone where there's a water table that's sloping down at this uh, gradient, Above it is what's sometimes referred to the tension-saturated zone. In other words, this zone here is still 100% filled with water, but it's done by the water is actually in slight tension in that zone. And then above this, the aquifer or the, the, the soil has only partially filled with water in the void space. It has air in it, and it has water. And so what would happen if you spill stuff into here is that it would happily just flow down vertically, driven by gravity. It would hit the water table if there was enough uh, components there. And it would slightly depress the water table as it pooled. And it would attempt, depending on how much you filled it, it would fill this up. Can you see the red on there, by the way? Looks pretty good. On, yeah, you can. Looks good on my screen, too. And it would make a lens of stuff that looks like this. And so this lens of gasoline, in this particular case, would have flowed down through this chimney. It would be present as a, a liquid which almost completely filled the pore space here. Uh, in the zone, in this chimney above, it would be present as a transitory component that has flowed through it. But with many things, you could imagine it has left kind of a smear. Some of the components have been left in here, although most of it has kept on traveling to here. And so you have a smeared zone here. You have a nice lens that sits here. It's taken the water table, and because this massive fluid has a pressure attached to it, which is higher than what was sitting on it before, it's depressed the water table slightly, whoops, which is why this is bowed. And 
Now it can do a number of things. These compounds are typically volatile, so they evaporate and they go into the Vado zone as a gas. Uh, absent any other behavior, this will probably sit quite happily here and not move. Uh, but because the water table here is at a gradient, then from what we've just said about Darcy's law, this is a change in head with length. So this gradient is not zero, and therefore you'd expect from Darcy's law that there should be some Darcy flow and therefore advective flow in here. So it will dissolve this component and carry it downstream as a plume. So this stippled area is the dissolved in water component of this original gasoline phase. This is the vapor phase that it sits there. And so this is what you'd expect if you spill. It's going to happen within maybe a week or a couple of weeks or a couple of months of this. But once it gets into this format, it will just sit there and it'll be happy. You might not be very happy, but it will be happy. If it didn't dissolve in water and off gas, we might not care because it's not going anywhere and it wouldn't be a threat to anybody, but it does. And so we'll want to be able to understand what the source region looks like, why it looks like this, why it has stopped at this location on the groundwater table, and what its morphology might be, because we'd be interested in trying to figure out exactly how we're going to remove this. And if we're exploring for this, we'd like to know what the shape would be to, to guide our choices, engineering choices. So if it's lighter than water, such as gasoline or kerosene or diesel fuel uh, would be, uh, jet fuel, I guess, diesel fuel is basically kerosene, uh, then it'll sit on top of the water table. Conversely, if it's denser than water, then what it will do is kind of the same thing. You put it in here. Uh, again, exactly the same geometry with the water table uh, inclined. But now with uh, a lower bed, which now we could think of it as being low permeability. So the permeability is low which isn't the key, uh, we refer to this as a capillary barrier. Barrier. And so here what happens, exactly the same as before, it goes down here, it leaves this nice smear as it goes through here, it hits the water table, no longer does it depress the water table because it is denser than the water that happens to be in this porous media, and it just shoots straight through and now it makes it keeps on going and so one question would be when does it stop we've kind of showed it stopped here but the question would be what is what are the characteristics of this medium underneath it that make it stop it's not permeability it just happens to be that permeability is associated with the diameters of the pores which are the capillaries which it can't get into very easily and it's actually the capillary diameter of this that controls it, not the permeability, but the two are related. And so it, a low permeability region, such as a clay or a shale, will stop it. A high permeability material like sandstone or a gravel won't. Uh, but it's not because of the permeability, it's because of the capillary sizes. And so it'll sit on here as a lens, just as we had before. It won't go any further deeper because of the capillary barrier. There'll be some of this stuff uh, smeared in here, and actually it'll be a bit higher concentrations. There'll be more in the pore space than just a smear. There'll be actually quite a, a high concentration here, but there'll also be water in the pore space here. There'll also be some water here, but more water here. And you'll have this smeared. Um, again, because of the gradient, the flow will be in this direction. And so again, the stippled region here is the dissolved component which is traveling to your light. And so those are the basic morphologies that we're interested in. And when we, as we talk about this class, um, the two behaviors, two broad suites of behaviors we're interested in is one, the multiphase flow behavior when you drop it in and it goes somewhere in the first two months and it ends up looking like this. It sits there as a source, happy as a clam, not doing anything but water's flowing past it. It dissolves slowly into the water, and as it gets dissolved into the water, it gets carried downstream. And that process is not 
removing this as a free product, as, as, a, as the gasoline, but it's dissolving it in water, and it's being carried down at very slow, small concentrations in the water. And that's a process that might be one year, two years, ten years, a century that's in the making. And so we will very distinctively talk about these two sets of processes. The first one in multi-phase flow today and the next few weeks. And then after that, talk about contaminant transport. So make sure you sort that out in your mind. The, the assignment, by the way, today is only about the second part of this, the contaminant transport part. So don't be fooled into thinking that it's just a warm-up assignment to get you thinking. Okay. So we don't need to talk about that. So what I want to do today is to talk about the information that we need to know to understand something about, to be able to make that calculation. <coughs> How long does it take to get into the ground? How do we characterize what that would be? What would it look like based on being lighter or denser than water? Two morphologies we've talked about. What, as we go up or down in these systems, what will the saturation profile of this invading, species, invading fluid look like? It's going to be very high saturation of that fluid here, but as we go up here in the smeared region, what's the saturation going to be? The reason we might want to know that is because if we're going to pump and treat it, uh, we can do some calculations to say how long we'd have to pump and treat. It's probably going to be a long, long time. But if we know what the mass is that we have to remove, then we can say something about designing that kind of process. Don't want to insert a photograph. So that's, that's what we'll talk about. So it all re uh, revolves around this idea of flow of emissile fluids. Um, the text for this, I don't think you need to go to this, but a lot of the figures we use is from Baer's book, Dynamics of Fluids and Porous Media. Um, we used to keep it in the library, but I'm not sure anyone looked at it, and so I'm not sure it's there now. So there are two types of fluid flows, miscible displacement and immiscible displacement, and the characteristics are here. Missile, miss, miscible displacement is when you take a beaker full of water and you drop a drop of ink in it, it dissolves in the water, and if you looked at the concentration of the ink when you first drop it into the water, then it would be 100% ink in the ink blot, 0% ink outside it. I'm not doing a very good job of doing this, but this red line would be the concentration of ink at time zero. This would be the blob of ink in the beaker. If you went away for a few minutes and came back and then the concentration would change uh, to look like this. And it would change because it's diffusing. It's uh, ficky in diffusion. It's just spreading out. And you'd see it because the, uh, instead of seeing a, a dot inside a clear water area, it now become murkier. And you'd see kind of, a, uh, kind of a dot, but it would have a halo around it, which had fringes on the outside, which were very low concentration. And it would have fringes as you got further in, there were higher concentration and more dense. It's basically what we're talking about in terms of contaminant transport. It's no different from that. Except in contaminant transport, the beaker you might be carrying from one side of the room to the other to represent it going down gradient in the, the aquifer. But that's advection is there. And so for miscible displacement, we have two fluids. Uh, there's no interface between them because they mix. They're miscible. There's no interfacial tension that acts between them. And the process by which they mix is uh, by diffusion in a beaker. We'll talk about hydrodynamic dis dispersion, which is just a tortuous mixing, mechanical mixing of it. If you took a, a spoon and stirred it, that would be mechanical dispersion. In an aquifer, it happens because it flows in and out of the different pore throats, and it gets agitated and mixed that way. So that's miscible displacement, which we are not yet talking about. Immiscible, immiscible displacement is where, where they don't mix. The fluids flow separately as unmixing fluids. And it is something that is not a million miles away from the problem that you talk about in terms of sticking a capri tube in water and seeing how high the water rises up in that capri tube. Same processes. The process that drives that is interfacial tension between the glass capillary and the fluid, which kind of sucks it up. Don't need to deal with that now. But that will be the model that we use to represent porous media. 
Um, and we can think about that in terms of what we'll talk about as a capillary pressure difference. That will become clear later as well. Um, and I suppose it's worthwhile making the point that if the fluids were truly immiscible and never mixed, and never diffused one into the other, then there would be no problem. You'd leave it in the ground, it would never dissolve in groundwater, it would never get carried down to a compliance point where someone's using a well and it's dissolved in water and you drink it and you die in 30 years. That wouldn't happen if it was truly immiscible. But these fluids do dissolve in water and therefore we do have to worry about that. So, that's the deal. And the other thing that we should also note is that when we're talking about immiscible fluids, we're talking not only about putting, say, an apple, a non-aqueous phase liquid, into the aquifer where water is, where they're mixing, but we're also having it flow through the Vado zone where it's going through air. So the two fluids could be air and water in the Vado zone, or air and water and oil in the Vado zone, actually three fluids, or oil and water in the groundwater zone. So hence multi-phase, not dual phase flow, but multi-phase flow is the topic. In terms of some definitions, um, well, we uh, will use some definitions of saturation and fluid content. And so what we could do, I suppose, if I skip back to this, we could go into this little region here and I could draw a little box and I could take that box out and I could look at it and it would have some pores in it. Uh, which would be these circles and the void space would be the stuff in between. And if I could imagine centrifuging it, if I could centrifuge quartz, then I could imagine that I could divide it into uh, the grains and the pore. And the pore would have what we've called before a volume of the voids and the grains would have a volume of the solid and so the pore space you could imagine in this point here could be filled um, originally it was filled with air because it's in the Vado zone we've now put some of this uh, napple into it so it'd have napple in it as well and it could also have uh, some water in it some residual water that of course can only reside in the pore volume, right? And so we make the distinctions between these uh, components. So the other way I could also do it, I'm not sure we need to need this, but it could be volume of the solid volume of water volume of gas and volume of the napple. Just three components. Those are, we'd never have more than three components. And this would all fit in what we've originally defined as volume of the voids. So just by convention we can define that. It probably would have been better if I drew it on the same figure we'll use, but uh, we can all come back to it, remember. I think the definitions are pretty straightforward. So the saturation of a fluid is the volume of a particular fluid within the REV. REV is a fancy name for representative elemental volume. has a very specific meaning. It means you choose a volume large enough to represent the system so that it's not, so it's really representative of the behavior of the aquifer. It doesn't really matter here. So you, you look at the volume of fluid, it doesn't matter that this part really. Within, so you take a, a cube, you look at the volume of a particular fluid in there, and you look at the volume of voids, what we've called VV, and you look at the ratio, and that's the saturation. So if the volume of voids is one centiliter, you have one centiliter of fluid in it, 
then by definition it's 100% saturated with that fluid, that value you want. If you have one centiliter and you have a tenth of a centiliter of water and nine tenths of a centiliter of gas, then the saturation of gas would be 0.9 and the saturation of water would be 0.1. It's just a ratio of how much of the void space is filled with something. Uh, it's worthwhile mentioning saturation because there are different definitions for what the fluid content is in a reservoir or an aquifer. This is, if you like, uh, the petroleum definition. This is the soil physicist's definition. and also hydrologists. Which you are, kind of, will be, if not already. And they use a different basis. So the volume of water divided by the total volume of the, of the container. So the total volume of the container contains the void space and the solid. And you're looking at the volume of water divided by the total volume of void and solid together. And so the upper limit for this, um, so I guess this is theta max. So the maximum volumetric moisture content you can get is going to be equal to the porosity, which is equal to the volume of voids divided by the total volume by definition. That's the definition of porosity. N is process. We'll use it throughout this class. So volumetric moisture content for soil physicists is defined relative to the whole volume, not just the void volume. Yeah. For the purposes of this class, we'll be using the same. We'll use, we'll use this, and we'll use this. And for people who do foundation engineering, we won't. Soil mechanicists can mechanics, so soil mechanics, people who turn wrenches on soils, it's a real name. Uh, the moisture content is on a weight basis. Weight of water divided by the weight of the solid. It's convenient because you take a soil sample that has, this has come from the field, uh, it has the same amount of water in it when you sampled it, so you weigh it, you put it in an oven for 24 hours, evaporates off the water, you weigh it again, you take those two weights from each other, that gives you the weight of the water, and then if you divide the weight of the water by the weight of the remaining solid, you know what the moisture content is on a weight basis. So these, I guess, are both uh, volume basis measurements, and this is a, a weight basis measurement. So they're different now, and, and we won't use this. But you should be aware that when people talk about moisture contents and volumetric moisture contents, and saturations, there are different languages from different communities and can be converted to, to talk about the same things. Okay? All right. Uh, we looked a bit of, at this last time. Um, so this is part of what we're trying to do. Trying to move that over, I guess. Still. So these are the, the kinds of behaviors that we're trying to, to represent. And this is these are all Dean apples, right, by definition. This is the water table. This is the capillary barrier. They talk about different kind of uh, structures. And you can see by looking at these, this is kind of a smeared progression as you go into the subsurface. This is little lenses that have buoyed this stuff up that it's filled up and then it's flowed off the side of it and it's pulled it on other little lenses as it's gone down. So maybe layered deposits with capillary barriers where this is accumulated and then flowed through. Uh, in some cases there hasn't been enough to get down all the way to this capillary barrier because of smaller spill. In some cases there's different material at the bottom that has allowed it to behave differently at the bottom than it did at the top. And so we'd like to be able to understand why those behaviors occur uh, from a physical standpoint. And it's moderately straightforward. Um, and that's, that's just, 
I suppose it's this is a microscopic picture. So if you zoomed in on one of those areas, I don't know how well you can see this. <coughs> this is yeah, you can't see it reasonably well, right? You see here that these are individual glass beads in an aquarium. These are smaller glass beads. These are still big glass beads, so somewhere across here, I guess, there's a, a boundary between those two different materials. And so what you see here is that you can imagine that this is a, a non-aqueous phase liquid. It's in water, I think. Uh, it's quite in hi quite high saturations or concentrations within the pore space here because it's quite dense and opaque. Um, it's come down through a chimney here and then flowed sideways. It hasn't presumably come through here because it hasn't left a smear. And it's basically stopped at this boundary, except for some little places where it's managed to finger its way through. And it's fingered its way through because if you think about a bead pack with small beads and a bead pack with big beads, then the gaps between these, the pores, would be larger in the bead packs with the larger beads the poor, poor diameters would be larger here than they are here. And so it's been stopped here because the poor diameters are small, but it's found a way to get through the, here by two, two mechanisms. One is it's found a path which we could surmise has some larger poor diameters in, which has allowed it to favor this transport path than, say, going through here. And it's also had this weight of fluid sitting above it, which is providing this extra pressure here to be able to force it through here. And so the mechanisms by which it's done this is by being uh, pushing against interfacial tension, which has tried to stop it from flowing into it. And so that's what we're going to attempt to understand a little about. So that's my segue into talking about what might seem to you as kind of a, an esoteric subject, but it's not. It's kind of the, the crux of what we're attempting to, to deal with here. This part is esoteric, but it's a useful definition. Um, surface tension uh, is uh, defined as the stickiness, if you like, of the surface of a fluid when it's in touch with its own vapor. So water with water vapor on top of it. Interfacial tension is the tension that's exerted between either two fluids or a fluid and a solid with no vapor involved in between them at all. And so that's this. So in this particular case, this would be interfacial tension between fluids I and fluid K, which are different. And this would be surface tension for fluid I with its vapor and separately fluid K with its vapor. And so Dupre's formula basically says that the uh, surface tension of fluid 1 in contact with its vapor plus the surface tension of fluid 2 okay, with its vapor, the amount of energy you need to, to separate them is an amount of work which is given by its interfacial tension. So these are physical constants, I guess. Right? No, I guess. They are physical constants. And so these are measurable quantities that you could look up a textbook to have. But if you know what these properties are, what you can determine is how much work you have to use. By the way, the units of these are in newtons per meter. It's not a stress. Stress is newtons per meter squared. Newtons per meter if you remember back to 303, if that doesn't give you nightmares. Um, then, by definition, uh, this... Yeah, this, this amount of work that we have to uh, apply here is given by these constants, a magnitude from a, text, a reference book, magnitude from a reference book, and another magnitude from a reference book. The amount of work you have to do to separate them is given by this formula. So that's a, an aside, but it's not something that's particularly useful for us. Just it's useful to, to realize that. 
And I guess, yeah, so the reason these are newtons per meter is you could think of a newton per meter as a newton meter per meter squared, right? Multiply top and bottom by meters, and this is true. And so what this represents is this is the amount of work, which is newton meters, that you have to apply over a surface area of one square meter to separate two fluids. Yeah. I was trying to figure out exactly how this works. This is the amount of work that you have to apply, and it's because it's work per unit meter area of the two fluids in contact. Wait, so yes. did you say W is equal to units are newtons? Uh, no, if you take this whole equation, so W is in units of uh, work per unit area. of contact. I'll never ask you this, so you don't actually need to know it, but I will explain it since you asked the question, and since I'm talking about it. So you have two fluids, I and K, like they are here. They're in contact with each other. You want to separate them. They're not mixing. You want to separate them uh, from each other so that they're in contact with their vapors. The amount of work you have to produce in a one meter square area of this is this to do that. And you can calculate what that work is if you know these material constants for this. So other than that physical sense of what's going on, it's actually relevant to our conversation here. You'll be happy to know. But it's a broadening experience. But the, the parts that are of importance is that we're talking about fluids in porous media, but first let's think about them uh, fluid on fluid. So if you take water, liquid A, and you put liquid B on top of that, say it's gasoline, and water had a free surface with air above it. So air, water, gasoline. One question you might ask yourself is, what would that look like? Will it look like a nice bead of water as a bubble that sits on top of the water? Or will, as you know, it separates into a sheen, which is one molecule thick, and goes forever as far as it can. Why is that? So one way to look at that is to do a free body and to take this lens when it first gets dropped on the water, and this is gasoline, and it slightly depresses the surface of the water because it has some weight to it because it has a height. Even though it's less dense than the water, it has a height to it. And your question is, will it spread out or will it stay as a bubble sitting on top, a, a solid bubble? And so you can think about it is that if the force that gets applied, if you look at the forces at the boundaries between these fluids, this kind of triple junction, and you think of them as fluids that aren't so different from the fluids that we talked about, this is a, the surface tension between two fluids, a gas and a liquid, uh, yeah. or a, a liquid and a liquid. It can't be a gas and a gas, right? I guess it can be a liquid and a liquid. Then if we know these material properties for the interfacial tension between the gas and liquid B, the interfacial tension between liquid A, which is water, and the gasoline, which is liquid B, and the interfacial tension between the air, sorry, between liquid A and the gas above it, these are all defined quantities which we can get. Then if we calculated what the net force imbalance was, if we found that the force pulling it in to the left is larger than the components of force pulling it to the right, then we'd figure that it would just spread out over the top of the surface. If we found out the components of these two forces together, pulling in the x direction against this force also in the x direction, if the sum of these two were larger in the x component, then it would keep itself up as a bubble. That's really cool. So if we know, if we take the components of these forces, which you know will just be the, the cosine here, probably spending too much time on this for the, this value, and we look at the force balance, if we know from the material properties that this force pulling to the left, by definition, bless you, is less than the sum of the forces pulling to the right, 
just ignoring these cosines, because it actually will be very flat. It won't be a big steep um, rise. This lens would be really quite flat. It would be much closer to being this rather than being this. And so if you just look at the uh, balance between these two added together, then if this number is bigger than the sum of these two numbers, then it will be a monolayer. If the opposite is true, then it will be a bubble, and it would survive that way. Okay. So we're interested in fluids in contact with grains within porous media. So if we take a grain, and if we just take a very small segment of that surface, so it's actually a flat surface in the limit, right, this, this part here, then we can think of it like this. This doesn't look so different from this. Again, we have a liquid bead sitting on the top. We have a gas above it. So this is water. This is a gas. This is the quartz. Could be a windshield for that matter, glass surface. Quartz is essentially glass, is glass. And we can look again at the angles. This angle now is the interfacial tension between the, the solid and the liquid. No longer two liquids or a liquid and a gas, which can be defined. And we can apply the same calculation. If you look at the balance where this force is larger than the sum of this force plus the component of, uh, I guess it would sigma gl cosine theta, we're just assuming that this is very small and it's basically, sorry, not zero, but one. Theta is zero, but cosine theta is one. Then what we can do is we can say something about whether it would spread or not. We could also, if we wanted to, just by rearranging this equation where we don't consider this being one, we could calculate what this angle is. And we, like, we would like to do that, actually, in this case. So we won't assume this, but we'll use this if we know these other three quantities, which are known quantities, we could calculate what this cosine angle is, or what the angle is, what the cosine is, and therefore what the angle is. And so the relevance of that is that we like to know, we, we would use this to be able to say, actually, the same kind of analysis. In the same way that we'd like to know whether this would run over the surface of the water and keep on going as a monolayer, we might be interested to know if the same would happen on the quartz that is our grain, in other words, whether it was wetted, wetted by water or whether it was hydrophobic, didn't like water. And we can tell that by, by the size of this angle. And so basically, if we can calculate this angle from these material properties, we can say whether this angle is greater than or equal to 90. So let's see. Um, I'll just draw a picture for each of these. If the lens of water, say this is water, <coughs> on top of the substrate, by convention I should also say this is theta, and in this particular case it's less than 90 degrees, right? You always draw the angle between the solid starting in the liquid which has the highest density, just by convention. Li water is more dense than air in this particular case. And therefore, we'd start here. And this angle would be 45 degrees. If it's less than 90, then, in other words, the water is said to wet the solid. It loves, the solid loves the water. You can't get enough of it. The opposite case is a bead of water that sits on top. Um, again, you, we draw the angle from the solid. So this is the tangent of that angle here, right? And so the angle in this particular case is this. So this is theta. So this theta is about, I don't know, 120 degrees. So you can think of this as a bead of water that's sitting on your windshield that's just sitting there, and it has air underneath the side of it. Then this is the case where the interfacial angle is greater than 90 degrees, and by definition, the water, the liquid does not wet the surface, or the gas, yeah. The, the, the liquid is non-wetting, 
the gas is the wetting fluid. In other words, if you think about the gas, the gas is here in this little wedge, which just looks like this wetting wedge here. In other words, the one that forms the wedge. So it's a, a terminology difference, but it's important because it makes a lot of difference as to how um, how porous media behave. So, and you've seen a bit of this before. Um, certainly in any fluid mechanics course, anyone worth their salt would talk about the different interfacial angles. So you take a capillary and you put it into water. So you take a capillary tube and you put it into water. Uh, and if you do that in water, then you'd get a, a rise within the water, which would look like this. It would have a, a concave surface to it, concave upwards, and it would look like this. So if you touch it with water. If you did this in uh, mercury, then it would look like this. Two things. The height would be depressed, be down, and it would be concave downwards. And so those are, with the same material glass and two different fluids, you get two different behaviors. Glass is water wet, but it is um, not hydrogen. Uh, mercury, non-wetting. So the same solid material with two different liquids. In some cases, with water, if you have two different solid materials, for instance, quartz, glass, is often water wet, and it would look just like this, concave upwards. In carbonates, are typically uh, water non-wetting, and the meniscus would be the other way down, just like it is for glass and mercury. And so the, the behaviors of the components uh, matter. So not only is interfacial tension important to us, but it also uh, depends on the, f the solids and the fluids that are interacting with each other. Most of the things that we talk about will be water wet, but uh, not all. Carbonates, for instance. OK? So that's important. Um, go on, talk about that. These are the figures that support this. This is an important physical figure, I think. Whoops. This comes out of Bear's book also. Uh, so these are two reservoirs or aquifers. The, the cross-hatched portions of the grains, the, oh, it's cut off at the bottom. The black is the oil, and the white is air, uh, water, sorry. So white is water, black is oil, black oil, and the stippled is, uh, are the grains. In a normal reservoir, which is water wet, sandstone. And this is, you start off with a reservoir which has lots of oil in it. That'd be a good reservoir. You suck the oil out because you want to drive a car. You can't suck it out with, without replacing it something from conservation of mass. And therefore you have to replace it with water. So you drive water in to force the oil out. So this is how you start with blobs of oil in it. You suck the oil out and you replace it with water. And as you replace more and more of the oil with water, you start from this so-called um, pendular saturation. To so-called funicular saturation. Latin, I suppose, right? So pendulum must be the root of pendulum or pendant, so a glob, if you like. Funicular is like, as in funicular railway, a cog railway that takes you up a mountainside. In other words, you're carried by, by the railway up the mountainside. And so what that means in this context is uh, pendular saturation is a big glob of oil that sits in here. But if you drew the contact between these two grains, what you'd find is that there is water sitting in this little region here. So sitting in this little uh, triangular region, it's also, by the way, covering a monolayer that goes across the grains. So it's white 
all around the grains, but there's also this little wedge in here, which is this part here. And so if you think about it, as you go around the grain, 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 there's a, a ring that goes around here. It's like a little triangular wedge that has, it's like a donut around it. But the pendular, I suppose, refers to the, the blob of oil that's sitting in here. As you keep on pushing in water, this wedge gets larger, as you see here, and larger. And then you're left with these uh, still blobs, but much smaller blobs of oil. And the reason that it's referred to as funicular saturation is that if you want to get this physically out of here, there is no connected phase of oil in this. If you imagine coming out of the, the page around the grain to this point, they're joined by oil. And so if you suck on the oil, the oil will suck itself out in a continuous phase all through the medium. Here, the oil may or may not be connected between pores. And here, almost certainly, because it's isolated in a bath of um, water around it, it's not connected to any oil whatsoever. So the only way you can get this oil out of here, this last remaining portion, is to physically suck out the water and hope, like on a funicular railway, that the oil gets carried out with it as well. Uh, hence funicular. And so this is kind of the bane. This is why when you recover oil from petroleum reservoirs, you leave 50% of the oil, 40% of the oil in place. And it's why when you remediate uh, contaminated aquifers, if you can't get all of the oil out of it, which you can't, then you have to you have a problem because it will keep on dissolving and being present in the downstream fluids. Uh, and if you start off with a sand which is uh, oil wet, then it's the oil which is present in these wedges, and it's the water which is the globs. Everything is just, just reversed. And so that's all based on the affinity of the fluids to be able to, to like the materials or not. Okay? So, so that's kind of the, the practical ramifications of that. And the previous pages were just my description, which I've given you verbally. Oh, you probably hoped you'd never have to see this again, but you're going to have to. So we've done, we've done this before in a previous class. Um, the behaviors you can imagine, we can take a bead pack, and instead of thinking about balls of quartz and spaces between them, we could think about idealizing the spaces between them as just a bunch of capillary rods which are all in series or yeah, parallel to each other. And those are the paths by which fluids go down. So let's take one of those capillaries and think about how it might be able to transmit fluids. Uh, and what we can basically do is we'd like to be able to see what kind of pressure force we'd have to apply to be able to push fluids along this capillary, either up or down it. And to, to know about that first, what we can do is we can look at the behavior of a capillary on its own. And if we wanted to know, for instance, what this height rise was, this height rise is really, you can think of it as the pressure which is reduce, uh, resisting it moving along this capillary. We can get by knowing that sticking the capillary tube in water, it will rise up to this amount. Atmospheric pressure acts at this point here. By definition, on a horizontal line, this must be atmospheric pressure here. So what we could do is we could cut this off and we would have a capillary which now is disconnected at the bottom, which we're holding up by applying a force at some angle here around this periphery. And this force has to be enough to counteract the weight of this whole thing. And so if we do that, we end up with the interfacial tension. This is the circumference. So in other words, this circumference here, this is diameter D, I guess. So pi D is this circumference. We have an interfacial tension pulling it up, which is the force that's applied uh, on these, in this torus around here. And its component in the vertical direction is equal to the cosine of the angle that it makes uh, with this. This angle theta is this angle in here, which is the same as this angle here, obviously. So that's the force that is holding it up. The weight of this is going to be the unit weight of the fluid, 
multiplied by its volume. This is just the volume. So pi d squared upon 4 is the cross-sectional area of this. And the height is just the volume of a cylinder. And if you manipulate those or rearrange them, you end up with this height rise, which is what we know. We also know that a head is equal to a pressure divided by a unit weight, by definition. And so we could actually replace this by, it's kind of the, if it, if it was just sitting here and didn't have interfacial tension working, it would be the pressure that we'd feel at this point uh, just due to the height of this above it. But that's not quite the case, right? So in other words, it's more convenient for us instead of using this height to be able to define it in terms of pressure. And we can write it as a pressure in this form. And so if we wanted to, we could substitute this into here. And the other thing uh, that we're really representing is that this height rise actually is the difference between the pressure that exists across this interface. So if I took this circle and I drew it instead as a little square, was here, then there'd be a pressure of the air, which I'm going to call the non-wetting fluid, and there would be a pressure in the wetting fluid, which is the water, and they'd be different. This curvature of this surface, this meniscus, is basically allowing a different pressure to exist between these two different things. So we can do this analysis a different way we want, but the pressures are actually different. And it's this difference in pressure, which is a parameter which we can define in reservoirs, which we'll call capillary pressure. It's given the symbol P sub C, and it's the difference between the pressure in the non-wetting fluid, the oil, or the air, and the pressure in the water. And they're different from each other for the argument that we've just had here. And our reason for defining this term here is that we could now write this as equal to, say, the capillary pressure divided by the unit weight of some fluid. What did I just do? I don't know. No. I think I just closed it. Well, that wasn't very clever. Fantastic. An idiot and a genius at the same time. <laughs> Come on, light now. And so the only problem here is that we can make this substitution. We, of course, could remove both of these. But it's not clear, do we choose the density of the water or of the air? I'm not sure which we should. So there's some ambiguity. But the point, point is that we can now use this to define the capri pressure. And the capri pressure difference would just be this expression here that we've got four times unit interfacial tension divided by the diameter. And you see it down here. And so physically what this says is that the difference between the pressures in an aquifer between the oil and the water, they can be different. And the difference in those pressures will be large if there's a big interfacial tension between them or if it's a very small pore throat. They both seem kind of intuitively reasonable, right? If physically there's a big interfacial tension, it means it can provide a lot of force to separate. If you're trying to push the water into the system, it will resist it because there's a large force. And maybe counterintuitively, if the diameter of the tube is small, I guess it's because it has a high surface area compared to the, the, the amount of force you're applying to the cross-sectional area of the capillary, is that it will re reduce, uh, resist pushing through it. So capillary pressure is directly proportional to interfacial tension, inversely proportional to uh, the diameter.
I'm going to run you right till an hour and 15 minutes. We can look at these in a different way. I won't belabor this point. So we've looked at, yeah, okay. So we've looked at this before in terms of thinking of it as bundles of capillary tubes that we're trying to force stuff through. But we could now go backwards and say, that's not really what a porous medium is. It's a whole bunch of beads, marbles together, which have pore spaces between them. And if you looked at the uh, interfacial behavior in that case, take two of these marbles, they contact each other point on point. If you had water that was in contact them, with them, then this black stuff here would be the water wetting water. It actually would actually cover the surface all the way here. We don't care about that. But if you think about this ring, this donut that goes around it, then there are two curvatures. There's a curvature here, which has some radius, r prime. And if you look down in plan view, this torus goes around it. The other curvature is this as it goes around the ring. And it turns out that the pressure difference between the air pressure and the water pressure here is given by a similar expression, interfacial tension multiplied by 1 over this radius of curvature and 1 over this radius of curvature. Because you can think of it as a surface that bends this way and also goes around this way as well. So it has two curvatures attached to it. And this is, if you like, kind of a, an average of those two. You're adding them together. You're adding the reciprocal of them together, but you're adding them together nonetheless. And so if you wanted to, you could imagine that if the saturation of water changes, a very small saturation of water would be a little wedge <coughs> that would look like this. I think you can see that, right? And this other black area would now be white. So this would be a lower saturation, which would have a smaller radius of curvature around it, and I think also a smaller radius of curvature in the vertical plane. And we could calculate exactly what the capillary pressure would be. And if it had an even larger saturation, more of this space was filled, then certainly this radius of curvature, r prime, would be much larger. And so you could imagine in this particular case that you could change the saturation of how much water was in here. Zero saturation when there's none. 100% saturation where I guess it was filling this whole thing, where, by the way, for a straight line, what's the radius of curvature for a straight line? It's infinite, right? It goes to infinity. And you could calculate what the capillary pressure changes would be as a function of saturations. Might mean nothing to you now, but soon, not today, we're going to start talking about graphs that link saturation with capillary pressure. Don't, don't do it today. And so finally, uh, not quite finally, but as far as we'll get, the other point to think about, oh, let's, let's uh, talk about, I'm going to talk about that previous point next time. If we wanted to, the same analysis that we've just done for a capri tube, where we've taken um, a tube and a height rise that exists above a water surface, which is H sub C, and all we did was calculate how much force we'd have to apply acting up here relative to what is the, the weight of this. This was how we got that previous expression, which was whoops, this. In some places, uh, we're interested not only in what happens in bundles of capillaries, but we're also interested in what happens in fractures. So if you think about ground, you drive the bypass, you go past these rock faces of limestone, which have limestone blocks separated by faults and fractures. Fractures are much more open than the pore space within the matrix of the limestone. Then you could imagine that fractures might be an, an easy path for stuff to get into the subsurface. So it turns out that we could do the analysis that we did here exactly with fractures to look at the height rise of a fluid between two parallel plates. And if we do that 
we end up with an expression that says the height rise is again proportional to the interfacial tension as it was before and inversely proportional to the equivalent dimension of separation between those which is a analogous if you like to the diameter of the capillaries and it has the same ramifications small separation very large height rise but you require very large force to be able to push it along it and if you have a very large resistance because of the material property <coughs> then you have a large resistance to it and so uh, so we're talking about the mechanisms by fluids travel independently and the basic message is from this is that the largest force that's acting on these forces are the meniscus forces which get progressively larger as the capillary diameters get uh, smaller and therefore that's why we could surmise that in this figure when we talk about this it gives exactly the rationale why it stops at this point here because the capillary diameter beyond this is too small and if it's going to get beyond that it needs to find a pathway where it's slightly large enough to be able to do it and I'll leave it there. Okay. I like to chat as you know so sorry we've run by a minute but we'll be okay any questions <coughs>